Good morning. Welcome to Calvary. We're Calvary Lutheran Church this morning, and so glad to welcome you here as we continue to celebrate the Sundays of Lent. Today, as we think on what we're leading up to, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and Palm Sunday, as we think on the celebrations of Palm Sunday, the palms thrown in in the street, waved in the air, people throwing their coats such that Jesus can march triumphantly, victoriously into Jerusalem. We think also upon our gospel story today, where Jesus is not celebrated, where Jesus is not elevated, but rather his own disciples are debating what's next when Jesus is gone. His disciples are jockeying for a position of power themselves. And as we think on these disciples, we think on our own selfish desires, our own need for recognition, for identity, for power, for privilege. And we come to this Jesus in repentant faith in what he will do later in that very week where he will die on the cross for us. As we think on all of these things, I invite you to stand now and join me responsively in our opening sentences based on our Old Testament reading today. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and they shall be my people, and I will be their, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. I invite you to turn and face the cross as it enters the sanctuary. That if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
we pause for a moment of self-reflection of our individual need for God's grace. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake he forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, who has revealed to us your great love in Christ our Savior, and written your covenant on our hearts, grant us such faith that our daily joy is in sharing your love in what we think, say, and do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We are seated for our hymn. Our epistle reading for this day comes to us from the fifth chapter of the letter to the Hebrews. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but, what, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was the son, he learned obedience through the, what he suffered and being made perfect he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now take a moment for the youngest members of our congregation and our children's message. Good morning. 
today, I want to ask a, a couple of basic questions because when I was younger, I used to think of Jesus as if he, well, well, maybe he just was always the same. What did Jesus look like when he was dying? What did Jesus look like when he was praying? What did Jesus look like when he was talking with his disciples? But that seems kind of silly, doesn't it? Jesus probably laughed. Jesus cried. Jesus was angry from time to time. Jesus was sad, and he was maybe even scared, too. We know a lot of these things actually happened for Jesus. Jesus did all kinds of things, and the lesson we just heard from Hebrews tells us that this, the fact that Jesus was sad sometimes or happy sometimes, that he laughed and that he cried, that Jesus experienced everything exper we experience as humans. This fact is good news for us. The fact that Jesus has laughed and cried and been sad and scared means that he knows how to help you when you are sad or scared or angry. Jesus knows how to celebrate with you when you are happy or excited too. Jesus knows exactly what you are going through in any and every situation so he can help you in any and every situation. But there's one thing that Jesus never knew, and that is sin. Jesus went through everything we experienced, but he didn't sin like we do. He didn't ever do anything wrong like we do from time to time. Instead, Jesus lived a perfect life such that now Jesus prays for each of us before his Father in heaven, before our Father in heaven. He makes petitions, makes prayers for us such that he can help us in every situation. And because Jesus lived that perfect life for us, because Jesus never sinned when he died for us, he took our sins away too. He wiped the slate clean for each and every one of us such that we could be with him, such that he could bring us to be with him, with his Father in heaven too. And so let's pray to Jesus now, who we know is listening and we know can hear us and understand what we are going through and that he will help us too. Dear Jesus, thank you for all of the ways that you have lived through the things that we have lived through, for the fact that you were sad sometimes and happy sometimes and angry and scared too. Thank you for all that you went through for us, but thank you even more for the ways that now you pray for us and the way that you died for us such that we can be with you. All these things we pray in your name. Amen. All right, you can return to your seats.
Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. And they were on the road going up from Jerusalem, up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise. And James and John, the son of, sons of Zebedee, came up to, to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink, and the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. At this time, we take a moment in the service to join our voices in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn of the day.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know about for you, but this particular passage is, is rather familiar to me. I feel like I know it very well. Maybe it's, it's famous and it just stands out because it comes at such a significant point in the year. But here we have Jesus predicting his death and then James and John coming with their unusual request. They want him to do what, whatever he asks of them. And when they reveal that request to them, to Jesus, they clearly want a position of privilege over their other disciple, brothers and sisters. We want you to do whatever we ask of you, they say. Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. While there's some debate over what James and John might think this means, what it means to sit at Jesus' right and Jesus' left, there's little debate among interpreters about one particular point, and that is that this is an impudent request, a bold request to make of a man who has just predicted his own death and resurrection. Their request to have Jesus do whatever they ask of him, well, it, it understandably not only seems to make the other disciples upset, but it seems to me that it makes Jesus upset too. So, what is going on here in this story? What, what are we supposed to learn from it other than that Jesus' disciples are, are somehow selfish or remarkably selfish even? Well, however famous this request may be, however many sermons you may have heard on it before, I'd like to encourage you to take a step back from what you think you know about what's going on. Because I have a feeling that unless you've studied these scriptures many times before, you're missing a key point which will help you wrap your head around what's really important here. For to really understand this passage, this moment and its significance, you need a critical piece of information which is not immediately obvious. And certainly you're not capable of re realizing from simply hearing this one passage. And that's this. In the context of Mark, nothing that happens here, well, almost nothing, is unique. See, first, Jesus has predicted his death and resurrection before. He's, he's predicted it now three times. Mark 8, Mark 9, Mark 10, every single one. He's been telling the disciples, and sometimes the people around him too, I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. This news should be amazing, mind-blowing, remarkable. And yet here, the disciples are so used to hearing it that they almost brush right past it. Yes, you, you've told us that before, Jesus. We've had time to process it, let's move on. But this isn't the only thing that's old news for them. It shouldn't be the only thing which is old news for us if we were listening straight through the, go the gospel according to Mark. Second, it's not the first time that the disciples have been jockeying for privilege and power and favor with Jesus. In Mark, this is at very least the second time, depending on how you read the stories of Mark, it might be the third or the fourth time, that the disciples have come to Jesus looking for his favor, looking for privilege over brothers and sisters. Last time, just like in our reading today, this debate occurred immediately following Jesus telling them about his coming death. This feels kind of significant to me. The disciples seem to hear, well, Jesus is going to die. That means one of us is going to have to take his place. Who's it going to be? 
If Jesus is going to die, who's going to step into that place of privilege and power and authority and fulfill what Jesus' ministry has been all along? I want to be that guy, seems to be the disciples' goal here. If this is true, we can, we can pretty quickly say, well, they probably don't understand the second half of Jesus' prediction, that He's going to rise again, at least not fully understand that prediction. But whatever the case, it's another thing that is simply not new. We're simply used to hearing in Mark. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Mark has now many times shown us instances of the disciples kind of making fools of themselves and needing to be corrected by Jesus. In many ways, what happens here in Mark today is old news. Almost nothing about this event is unique. But that almost is key. That almost nothing is, is really the key to understanding what is important in this moment. For there is something new. There is something unique about this death prediction which Jesus gives us today. He says, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give His life as a ransom for many." This is what's new, and this statement is what's really significant about this moment in Mark chapter 10. And I'd like to draw out just a couple of more context bits of information to help you realize how significant it is. This statement comes to us in every one of the synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say it almost with these exact same words. And while there is slight variation, each of the gospel writers considered it important enough to include in their own accounts even if in different ways, they all considered it important. And they all included it in important moments in their particular gospel story. All three said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. He came to give His life as a ransom for many. In this moment, we don't just get clued in on the reason behind Jesus' actions. In this amazing moment, for the first time, we understand why Jesus has come down from heaven at all. He is here to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. This is a, a, a remarkably clear statement in a gospel story which is full of secrets and surprise and confusion. Mark is, is filled with this idea of, of the messianic secret. What is Jesus here for? What is He doing? And there's this constant yearning among the disciples and anyone who reads Mark to, to really get the, the curtain pulled back, and here is where it is done. He's here to be served. He's not here to be served, sorry, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. On top of that, we get a new mission for Jesus' disciples. What are they to do? They are to do the same thing. In fact, they're going to do the same thing, James and John will at least. And when Jesus pull, pulls them all aside and says, okay, let's, let's clarify just a couple things, He makes clear that this mission of His is to be their mission too. This by itself would be significant, but we also, and perhaps most importantly, get the promise of Jesus' own sacrificial service. His choice to give His life 
sacrifice his life in order to serve and save them is perhaps the most important of all of these things. This response which Jesus makes to James and John's impudent request is Jesus trying to put the bickering to rest, to say, stop trying to be the best, stop trying to be served, certainly stop trying to serve yourself. For even Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. His every action from here on out will unveil what exactly that looks like and what it should mean for these disciples. Now that they have that clarity, they should see in Jesus the fulfillment of this promise. If you want to follow me, serve and give your life for others, Jesus is saying. And we can tell from their, that the way the disciples behave after this that they didn't quite fully get it, that it was hard for them to understand, and you might even say it was is foreign to their nature. What Jesus had asked of them was, was too much for them to really grasp in this, even in this critical moment when Jesus is as clear as he is. But before we judge these disciples, and it's, it's usually easy to do, right? Say, well, why don't you get it? Why, why? Jesus has spelled it out. He said it as clearly as he could possibly say. Shouldn't service be selfless? Shouldn't we want to serve if we're following Jesus and be selfless in it, even sacrificial in our service? Before we judge them in this way, with this kind of question, I want us again to take a step back. Because I fear if, if we don't, if we get laser focused in on this key moment, this one moment, and we don't consider our own selfish nature, if we don't consider the selfish nature of all of humanity, we will miss the best part of this entire gospel reading. See, we can lose sight of not just our selfishness, but we can lose sight of the way that we largely have Jesus to thank for the fact that we have a concept of selfless service at all. There are many things in this world, in our world today, in our culture, which might seem natural to us, which might seem natural especially to Christians, but which are just completely foreign to human nature. Things we take for granted, but which are largely due to Jesus' influence in the world. These are ideas like, like free grace, that grace is a gift. Honestly, the idea that gifts should be given freely without strings attached, without ex expectation of return, this is an idea which for most cultures in human history would have been foreign, would have been foreign. And yet as Christians, we often just take for granted that, well, yeah, you give gifts and, and then the person who received it can do whatever they want with that gift. You give gifts and you don't expect anything back. This is, this is just the way of things. In the same way, Christians' idea of submission to governing authorities, regardless of their worthiness, regardless of whether we like them, regardless of whether they're, they're good people even, this idea is, is foreign to the way humans live in the world, think in the world. The high value we place on children and on life at all, this is in many cultures a foreign concept. So this sacrificial service, this selfless service that we're talking about today is, is in the same vein, a foreign concept, just not, it doesn't naturally make sense. In every one of these you could preach a sermon on. But today, I, I'd like to as, as clearly and simply as, as I can 
state how, how unusual this idea is for us, or how unusual it should be for us. For we can, we can hear these things, we can take them for granted, we can, we can just pretend like it's not a big deal, but what Jesus is saying today is a big deal. This is, is a change of normal operating procedure. This is a change of expectation which we need to work to wrap our heads around. Briefly stated, apart from Christ and His influence in the world, service is not selfless. It's certainly not supposed to be sacrificial, but rather service is transactional. Service is selfish. It doesn't have to be money that you gain by this transaction. Your service of some, for someone else can result in a favor or, or a vote. It can just buy you time. All of these things can be purchased, can be exchanged in order for you to get someone else's service. Anything we value is worthy of making a transaction, an exchange to get it. Think of the service staff at restaurants in our world today. Do we think of those service staff, those wait people, as, as doing things out of love for their customers? I, I've been a waiter, and I have to tell you, a lot of customers made it really hard to love them. But when you're a service person, you serve. You serve and you do the best to, to ignore those ways that people are, are cruel to you, or demand too much of your time, especially more of your time than is merited by the amount that they're going to tip. You do all of this for the tip. You do all of this because good service means a good tip, or at least it's expected to. You do all of this for the, the paycheck at the end of the day. And this is just normal. This is what we expect. It's not that you do it out of love, at least not typically. In the same way, entire corporations operate. All good companies want to provide good service, but they don't do it out of love for their customers, at least not a typical company. Instead, companies go above and beyond because it's good for their brand. It's good marketing. It's good so that they can gain repeat customers and people come back and people buy more later it might not be immediately financially beneficial to go above and beyond, to make a couple small sacrifices as a company in order to provide that great service. But in the long run, companies depend on it paying off, expect it to pay, it up, to pay off, and they've found in time that it does. We even talk about the fiduciary responsibility that companies have to their shareholders, though. That at the bottom line, at the end of the day, the company's profit motive is first. The profit motive is, is first and has to be fulfilled. At the end of the day, no matter how good you want to make your service, you need the profit too. See, everything in our life, we might want to be an, a great example of selfless service and sacrificial service even. We might like the idea of saying, yeah, I work hard to serve the people around me, even when I don't get as much out of it as I might like. I work hard to serve my family or my employees or my employer more than they deserve. But I think if we admit our own selfishness, our own self-interest, if we look at our own heart, we would realize that, that we too, at base, are fundamentally selfish. It is in our nature to be self-interested. And if we are not self-interested, we are working against that very nature. Just as a, as a really quick test for yourself, in this, in this very moment, are you thinking about yourself 
and your own relationship with God and your own selfishness? Or are you thinking about the burdens and anxieties and fears of the people around you, the visitors in the pews today who you've not met before and who might be here only for one Sunday? Are you thinking about the people around you? Are you welcoming them? Are you thinking how you can be of service to them right now? I realize everything I've preached has had very little to do with the people around us right now. There's very little reason that you should be thinking about them right now, other than that we've been talking about them now for about a minute. But this is my point. It's not natural to be thinking about the people next to you. It's not natural to be thinking about service beyond your immediate vicinity. It's just human nature to be selfish and self-interested, interested in your own family, the functionings of your own tribe and your own community, and not to look outside of your blinders. It's just human nature to be selfish, to be self-interested. And it's when we accept this fact that we can now look back at James and John and see in them not, why don't they get it yet? But, well, it's, it's just a natural thing. They want a position of privilege and power, and they probably think as they're asking these things, well, we've got to continue Jesus' ministry when he's dead. If he's going to die, who knows how long till he rises again. We need to do the work that Jesus has set out to do, and we need to further the interests of the kingdom. And it feels very natural and feels very normal to say, okay, Jesus, we think we're the ones to do that. Jesus, in this light, in the light of, of James and John's own blunders, but especially in the light of our own selfishness, Jesus becomes a, a remarkable figure. For Jesus is not selfish. He's not self-interested. He's not making transactions with the disciples. He's interested in them. He's interested in us. Jesus is selfless and sacrificial in his service. As he said, he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He not only proves that it's possible to be selfless in your service, but he proves by his actions that it is good. He does this and he helps us he helps these selfish disciples realize all these things. And he helps us realize these things too. If we think today that service which is selfless is good, we have Jesus to think this is true. But this righteous example of Jesus is not just an example to follow. Jesus' righteous example, which does call us to repentance for our own selfishness, is also the means of our salvation. Jesus is not just an example here, but his selfless sacrifice gives his life as a ransom for me and for you. He came to serve us in order to save us. He gave his life as a ransom to save us from our sinful, selfish nature. Really, in spite of our sinful, selfish nature, he saved us. So as we think on all of this, on our own selfishness and the ways we can't escape it, even, even when we try, as we think on James and John and the other disciples and their inability to figure it out, we at the same time celebrate and rest in this promise of Jesus, 
the promise of his sacrificial, selfless service for us in that very peace of God, which passes all understanding and will guard your hearts and minds in that same Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. At this time, just a couple of brief announcements for everyone gathered here today and everyone joining us online. Thank you again for walking into worship today and and joining us to celebrate this, this Lenten season. But as we look forward to the week ahead, the Palm Sunday service, come the coming Sunday, Maundy Thursday, and Good Friday, and Easter Sunday, we do want to once again ask you, if you haven't already, to fill out that Easter survey for Easter attendance here in the sanctuary. With people getting vaccinated and more people being comfortable coming back to worship, we do want to make sure that we are prepared for the number of people who are coming to each individual service. So please do fill out that survey such that we can make accurate plans for the number of people, whether that means adding chairs to the narthex or setting up overflow in the gym based on attendance numbers, we want to make sure we're ready. Um, one brief note in that regard, currently, in case you are wondering what the attendance is looking like at each service, the services are pretty even with the exception of the 930 service, which is our current highest, at least reported attendance. So if you're looking for one of those services that's going to have more space for you and your family, we would encourage you to check that 6.30 Easter Vigil service or 8 o'clock or 11. The second announcement that I'd like to make today is in regards to an a initiative by the Compassion Ministry team. The Compassion Ministry team is excited to offer encouragement cards in the narthex, and we'd encourage you to pick those up as Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 says, encourage one another daily as long as it is called today. Last I checked, it is still called today today. So please do encourage one another. Please do make it uh, your mission to think of someone in your life, even if you're not making that goal of encouraging someone daily. Find someone in your life that could use a pick-me-up or a thank you and encourage them to keep up the good work Thank you for all that you do. Uh, we want to be a blessing to those around us. That's it in the way of, of announcements for today. So at this time, uh, as we think on all of the blessings that we have received, I invite you to stand and go to our Lord in prayer for the prayers of the church. So one addition to our printed prayers today is that we pray also for Garrett Lonis, who is recovering from a recent accident. And so let us now go to our Lord in prayer. Let us pray for ourselves, the church, the world, and all people in their needs. For the church here and wherever people gather around word and sacrament, that God would move us to true repentance so that we reflect in our lives the love that he has written on our hearts, let us pray to the Lord. Loving Father, hear our prayer the clergy and lay leaders of the church, that God would help them call the repentant back, enable healing across painful divisions, and teach catechumens of all ages the message of salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy on us, O Holy Spirit, that our Lord would bring about understanding across political borders, between racial, generational, economic, and cultural differences, and within all families. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord of the nations and Prince of Peace, listen to our plea. For teachers and students, for social workers and counselors, police and all first responders, that God would keep them safe and healthy, guiding them in crises and sustaining them in chronic problems. Let us pray to the Lord. Father in heaven, hear our prayer. For all who are in exile from home, those who have been incarcerated, and any who have not been treated with human dignity, that God would surround them with supportive individuals and organizations, let us pray to the Lord. Spirit of truth, increase their patience and hope that many may rejoice together. For those near and dear to us, including Margie Mason and Treva Gerke, as each are continued to be hospitalized, for Violet Fiorello, who is undergoing testing at this time, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would be with Nancy Miller and Janet Polk 
as each of them recovers from surgeries previously this week. May you continue to guide them in the days ahead, that in all things that they may be strengthened by your loving care each day. We also lift up, O oh Lord, Mary Ann Knauss, Chris Hyatt, Linda Heckman, Rob Taylor, and Kathy Rudy. Meet their needs and the many other needs of those who are listed in our prayers and those that we have upon our hearts and minds this day. May you be that very source of care and comfort in every time of need. And may you direct our attention to the very words of your hope and peace that are found for us, that we may be sustained for each new day. O oh Lord, we pray for the family and friends of Brian Russell who passed away this last week. May you grant to them care in the very time of their mourning. And may you continue to lead us to the very hope that is ours in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Finally, O oh Lord, we lift up prayers for the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Ghana, as well as the missionaries, Reverend Steve and Cynthia Schumacher. May you continue to bless the work in Ghana and all of the very opportunities that are there for your gospel to be shared. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Jesus, come to their aid. These and any other things that you would have us ask of you, Heavenly Father, grant to us for the sake of the bitter sufferings and death of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Thank you.